I'm very happy to welcome you to our uh, GeoMeter Speaker Series online seminar this time. I'm Cornelia Brandner and I'm the coordinator of the GeoMedia Center here in Karlstadt. Um, uh, again, uh, I want to remind you that uh, we will videotape the seminar for our uh, channels. Uh, today's topic is gentrification and the right to the GeoMedia City. And we will look at the interplay between gentrification and uh, media infrastructures. So that is a, a rather under-researched relationship uh, so far, and I'm looking very much forward to hear your talks. Andre uh, Janssen, the director of the Geomedia Center, will uh, soon start with an introduction. And then we will have Leonike Boldermann. She's assistant professor in cultural geography at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And she will talk about uh, Detroit Music City, analyzing Detroit's, mu Detroit's a musical urban imaginary through a, through a cultural justice lens. And Jelke Bosma, he's PhD candidate at the Department of uh, Media Studies and member of the Center for Urban Studies at the University of Amsterdam, of course, also Netherlands. And he will continue with uh, the topic, gen the gentrification of Airbnb, uh, closing rent gaps through the professionalization of hosting, and after a short coffee break, Maya Clausen, assistant professor at the uh, Department uh, for the Study of Culture at the University of Southern Denmark, follows with uh, on the geomediatized geo margins of digital citizenship, exploring the gentrified and digitalized lift spaces of all the Danish uh, citizens. And finally, we will conclude with an open discussion and uh, Q&A. So welcome again, Andre, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Cornelia, for the introduction. I, I will then just take this uh, like 10 minutes or something, just to give a little bit of background and some context to this special issue, which uh, the three presentations are, are part of. And I... Um, will share my screen here with you. So I guess you are able to see the screen. However, you disappeared from my screen, but let's see if I can. Well, Okay, I will do it without seeing you. That's no problem. Um, anyway, uh, a few words about uh, the background to the special issue. Um, this is something that my co-editor, Mar Hartmann, and I actually started discussing uh, at the conference uh, back in 2019, uh, the Geomedia conference uh, here in Karlstad. Um, but it was also, it's also a special issue that uh, has its root back in a, a bigger project application that we had uh, worked on, but that uh, was, was rejected. And then uh, we said, perhaps we should start to use the ideas in some other context. And also Maya Klaus and, and uh, Karin Fast, for example, were also part of that older project application. Anyway, what, what we think, that we saw at that time when we started discussing this was a couple of things uh, related to gentrification and media uh, that made it motivated, we thought, to, to have this type of project or uh, special issue. And the main obvious thing was that we thought that in gentrification research, there was much too little attention being paid to the role of media in different ways in these type of urban displacement uh, processes. And also that to the extent that there was any research in that area, mainly it had to do with how media was uh, were representing gentrification processes and also how different regeneration processes and so uh, or, or pro projects were marketed or imagined by policymakers and so on. But there was much less work done on technological infrastructures 
and patterns of media use. Um, what we also could observe at that time was that even though there was a kind of a boom in research dealing with a smart city and platform urbanism and, and things like that, um, there was not very much um, focusing on territorialization processes and how these new uh, kind of organization of urban life, how, how they led to different boundaries and forms of segregation in the city. It was more a stronger focus on, on citizenship in, in a broader sense. Um, and we also thought that um, gentrification as a process also tend to normalize certain forms of media and also certain ways of using the media uh, in the city. And then we're talking about media in a broad sense, of course, but also with a specific focus on the new uh, digital platforms that uh, surround us today. So that these were kind of the, the, the key entry points, but then also we could see, especially at the conference, where Maren was one of the keynote speakers and, and some of the others in this special issue were participating, that there was some interesting research uh, on its way. So we, we thought that this could be a good idea and we wanted to have a journal that was in the in between um, human geography and media studies. So we went for uh, space and culture as a, as a good solution, we thought. Anyway, so these are the seven articles that we ended up with and now they are, half of them are published online first um, the, and some of them are about to be published. So we have, except for the three uh, presentations that you will see today, we also have an article by Colin Fast, who has the right to the co-working space, reframing platformed workspaces as elite territory in the geomedia city. Uh, also a paper from Erika Polson from the tag to the hashtag, street art, Instagram and gentrification. And she's uh, focusing especially uh, on Denver and transformations in, in Denver, in Colorado. Um, then we have Maren Hartmann. She also has a paper on, on the Google campus protests in Berlin. And the final paper is Peter Va Walters and Naomi Smith's, uh, Smith. It's so ridiculously soulless, geolocative media place and third wave gentrification, which, and they, they are based in Australia. So we have, we are also covering different regions of, of the world. So th this is what the special issue looks like. Um, I will then also say, just mention three points that we are making in the introduction uh, to the special issue. The introduction, you can also find it online. It's, it's, uh, it's published, uh, it's written by Maren and, and myself. So, three points that we make based on the contributions uh, to, the, to, to the special issue. First, we, we try to introduce this idea of the geomedia city, and we see it not just as a city with a particular type of infrastructure. We try to advance the idea of the geomedia city as a regime of dwelling, meaning that we emphasize the importance of looking into the more mundane, everyday ways of basically living or dwelling, as we say, uh, with media as a normal part of the human condition. Uh, so it, the geomedia city then highlights the ordinariness of geomedia as well as its translation into discriminatory norms and routines that may be repressive or emancipatory depending on social context. These are things that we can see emerging in the different contributions. Uh, we also see digital resignation, which is a concept we borrow from Draper and Turlow um, as an important aspect of the ter territorialization in, uh, the in, in the geomedia city, meaning basically that it's not only about people, some people appropriating media, it's also the fact that to a great extent people are resigning and feeling that it's it's uh, really difficult to embrace or become part of digitalization processes. Something we can see, for example, in, in Maya's presentation uh, later on, I, I suppose. And thirdly, we also recognize gentrification in the geomedia city as a matter of cultural justice or injustice. And not least, not least issues related to data justice uh, are 
important here. And we also think this is some of the discussions that um, the contributions uh, such as Leonikis uh, today will also um, introduce, but we also see that there is a need for more studies on, on this correlation between gentrification and what could be called then the geographies of digital skill. So all in all, we think that the seven contributions, um, and they have proven to work quite well together, we think. So we are very happy with the special issue and hope to see all of the papers out also uh, very soon. Um, so I also want to take this opportunity to thank all the contributors for being part of the special issue. And with that, I will end this little introduction. I hope that you have some context to, to the talks that will be given after this. So back to you then, Cornelia. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Andre. And uh, without further ado, I will give uh, Leonike the, the word. <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Cornelia and Andre. Uh, I will share my screen. Let's see if this works. Uh, but can you see my screen or is it doing strange things? No, we can't see your screen. Oh dear. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, share this one. Yes. Okay. And then. Uh, see now it's showing presenter mode probably yes it does okay because uh, shoot. Mm. Um. i think if you stop sharing your screen and try it again there's an option to select a particular uh, window and then you can pick the not the presenter view but the, the other one yeah Okay, try that. Um, let me see if it works like this. Okay, does it work like this? There's still a panel with third, which which would show notes, but I I think we we could go with it. Mm. You're fine with it, but we can still see the the the, the notes panel. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I don't know why it's doing that. Stop sharing. Um, I hate when it does this. Um, I'm sorry about this. <laughs> So what you could also try is when you share screen uh, and go to the advanced uh, sharing options, you could uh, choose a frame and then just draw the frame over over your slides. Then you can just go with the, the one view we had because we then would only see the frame that you draw. Mm. Can you see it like this? Yes, no, it's perfect. Very good. <laughs> okay, finally. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Um, the only downside is that I cannot see my notes anymore, but we'll make do. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Okay, so um, 
this is, uh, I first wanted to start with uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Groningen, Faculty of Spatial Sciences. Um, my research focused on uh, music tourism. So this is a picture of me doing research. Um, and that was actually a, a larger project I did a few years ago. And currently I've moved more into uh, looking into um, uh, the role of arts and culture in urban development. And uh, that's how I'm also uh, uh, coming to look into gentrification. Um, and especially the question that was central um, to the, the call for papers uh, and that interested me. And that's the question, who has the right to the media city? Um, and for me, I approached this question um, actually with an interest uh, in street art uh, and uh, street murals, to be more precise. Um, and the interest there is, is on the, the current kind of double function of these murals in, in public space. On the one hand, they can be viewed as uh, a source of um, um, political um, expression, expression of uh, heritage, of identity, uh, and of place politics. Um, and that's also due to their being located in public space. Um, so they always have kind of this expressive quality um, by being there in public space. At the same time, what we currently see is that these murals are not um, only used as, as political expressions, but are also increasingly used uh, as uh, tools for um, urban uh, marketing, city marketing, for example. And um, there was this very interesting article uh, about a Korean village um, where murals were used to kind of beautify the area um, while they did not exactly express um, the ideas that, that the local community had about this area. So this tension present in these murals that brings this kind of tension uh, in public space as well interested me. Um, and of course, the, the um, perspective of the special issue is also about the role of mediatization here. Um, and then again, these murals are very interesting because uh, what we see um, is something called uh, the influence of the, the platform vernacular of social media. So the way that specific social media uh, structure uh, and influence the, the form, the shape and the content of murals in public space. Uh, I think a, a famous uh, example that, that you might recognize is the idea of the angel wings that you can take your Instagram picture in front of. Uh, and hashtag the city where you're at. Uh, this is a very visible one, um, but also in other ways, these murals um, are becoming more adapted to specific social media. And Instagram is one of the social media that plays a, a big role in this. Um, so all these things together really sparked an interest in looking at this, this kind of tension in muraling um, and the relation to mediatization, to the role of social media connecting public space um, with the local uh, and the, the, the translocal uh, in that sense through this, this um, role of social media in there. Um, so the uh, research question I used for this paper is uh, how is the urban imaginary of the music city mediated through street art and its meaning reconstituted and reframed through the platform vernaculars of the media sphere? Um, I chose to focus on the music city um, because um, as a case study, I chose the city of Detroit, the city that I was living in for a while. Um, and it's a city that has a very interesting uh, relation um, to gentrification, um, but also through uh, to muraling. Um, so um, uh, that's why I decided to focus uh, on Detroit specifically. Um, Detroit was a very successful city uh, in the, the early uh, uh, 20th century. Um, actually, in the 1950s, it was, it was a huge city in the United States um, with about 2 million inhabitants, and it was quite a wealthy city, the Paris of the North. Um, and since then, it has actually declined a lot. Um, and it has declined to such an extent that it's now actually uh, a city of ruins, you could say. Um, Andre has actually written an interesting article about uh, uh, urban explorers and the city of Detroit is a, a very uh, popular topic for urban exploring. Um, and actually Brian Doucette has written about Detroit as the metonym of urban failure. 
Um, so why are we talking about the city in the context of gentrification? Well, in recent years, uh, the city is really trying to turn a page and some areas of the city are uh, actually gentrifying already. Um, so this is actually a, a city, uh, the a picture of, of Detroit. Um, I'm not sure if you can see a um, marker here, but um, this is a picture of the city of Detroit and the red area kind of delimitates Detroit as well with little green dots in the, the southwest corner. And it's interesting because this depicts the city limits of Detroit, but it's also an uh, ethnicity map. So the red areas are majority black residents and the blue areas are majority white uh, areas. And the, the green part is actually uh, Hispanic. Uh, and this adds another interesting dimension, I think, um, to the research question that I had, because in Detroit, every question is also a question of ethnicity and of race, um, which adds, I think, an interesting layer to um, the notion of, of what that role, that tension of those murals is. Um, the role of social media in there, but then also the layer of um, uh, race and ethnicity in there, um, which is why I decided to approach my research question from the perspective of cultural justice. There was an interesting article uh, about uh, um, the analysis of cultural justice, and it was focused on popular music, and it offered a frame of analysis for looking at cultural artifacts um, through that idea of cultural justice, of power and inequalities. So I decided to explore that framework in the context of muraling and adapting it um, to make it applicable to a, a mediatized city. Um, so that all in all, I thought the city of Detroit was a very interesting case study for that and to really explore um, these notions, but also that framework. Um, so the cultural justice framework, but the articles by Cantillon, Baker and Nowak, and it proposes three dimensions through which to explore um, cultural objects, so to say. The first one is symbologies of place. So this really relates to um, the physical and digital remnants of, well, in their case, popular music. Um, so really more of the, the materiality um, and the analysis of the actual artifacts. So in this case, I decided to apply this to um, the analysis of murals. Um, but in order to adapt it to the media city, um, it was also important for me to look at um, that idea of the platform vernacular and how it was present in these murals. Um, the second dimension is historiographies of place. Um, this really relates to the narratives surrounding the cultural artifacts. So in this instance, the narratives that are there surrounding the murals. Um, and to adapt it again to uh, the mediatized city, um, I think it's important to look at the transmedia narratives in this sense. So a uh, notion by Jenkins, uh, how these narratives move across platforms uh, as well as on location. The third one is social ties and community networks, um, really looking at how um, these murals uh, and the narratives surrounding them are embedded uh, in several communities. And again, um, where the original article really looks at communities in place, local communities, I also wanted to include online communities. Um, and actually there were some great examples uh, of um, um, murals that, that had this dual function um, in Detroit. So we'll get to that uh, a bit later on. Um, so what I did, um, because this type of analysis also requires a lot of background knowledge, um, I decided to focus on uh, music murals um, because that is in my background, but also because I think music especially um, has this uh, uh, tension present and especially in the context of Detroit um, between um, um, political expression, but also uh, with race and ethnicity playing into the meaning uh, and the role of these murals in local communities. Um, I selected murals uh, from two uh, muraling projects actually uh, in Detroit, Murals in the Market and the City Walls Project, which is a municipality run um, project to beautify Detroit. Uh, but I also did my own um, 
uh, exploration of Detroit areas and documented all the music related murals that I could find. So the first part of the analysis was kind of a content analysis of um, this body of, of murals. Um, secondly, what I did was I selected three murals um, that had a very lively discussion around them uh, and around their creation and about their content. Um, and I analyzed these discussions. That was more of a discourse analysis um, based on uh, social media discussions, um, newspaper articles that were written about it. And I also did several interviews with people related to um, um, the creation or the discussion of the murals. So with artists, um, but also with community workers um, and people involved in the uh, um, projects um, through which the community or the, the murals were created. Um, so all this uh, uh, delivered a, a body of data that I could work with. And I analyzed this all through these three dimensions of that cultural justice framework proposed by Cantillon, Baker, and Novak. Um, so first, I will start with discussing the symbologies of place. So what I saw in these, uh, what came from this content analysis were several themes. First of all, many of the murals related to um, Detroit as a um, music city, obviously, with a focus on local uh, musicians and artists. So here is a mural um, actually on Eastern Market. Uh, and it depicts famous Detroit rappers. You can see Eminem in the center, but also Jay Dilla uh, and a few others there. Um, and there are actually several murals that depict all these famous artists. They're different, they're not all focused on hip hop, but it is a common theme running throughout this. Um, what's also interesting here is uh, this mural um, because it again shows famous Detroit artists, but it also references to um, black neighborhoods that were there in Detroit in the 1950s. And they're called Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. Um, what this mural shows is on the one hand, um, kind of the, the, the history and the identity of this area, but at the same time, it's also social critique because these two areas were demolished in the 1960s 60s to make place for two highways. Um, and the black communities that lived in these areas were displaced due to redlining practices. They could not live um, in other areas of the city. Um, and these were, um, there, the areas that they could live in, but they were destroyed due um, to making place for these highways. And actually, this this selection of murals uh, commemorates those areas. Um, and it's interesting because the location of these specific murals was uh, in an area that is slowly starting to gentrify and to, to change and to switch around. This is still a boarded up building, but actually a lot of projects are developed around this. Um, so on the one hand, it's, it's a memory to those areas um, in the history of the, uh, Detroit that showed displacement. But at the same time, you can also read it as a critique on what's currently going on. Um, which is that, again, um, certain groups of people are displaced by that, that, that gentrification that's going on here and replaced by uh, new inhabitants coming in um, that are more wealthy and have more opportunity that the people that remained in these areas through Detroit's hardships uh, and are now actually displaced. So um, already that's, that's an interesting development going on. Um, then third, it's not only about uh, social critique or racial critique, but this is actually a mural, uh, it's quite a famous one in Detroit by Pat Wilson, and it's more of an environmental justice uh, critique, actually. It depicts a marching band, referring to Detroit's uh, marching band culture, um, but it's marching, as uh, Pat Perry, the creator, says, uh, it's the march of a declining civilization making music out of uh, the end of the oil age because they're all playing oil drums, um, offering critique on uh, environmental issues. Um, and uh, a second kind of big theme coming from looking and analyzing these murals was uh, actually Mexican heritage. There are a lot of mural, murals and music related murals in Mexican town, which was the, the green area of the map I showed you. Um, but I will talk about that with the 
third uh, perspective of analysis because um, I can tell a bit more about that there. So I would now like to move on to um, the second uh, perspective of that cultural justice framework, um, which is the uh, idea of historiographies of, of place. And the mural I wanted to discuss there is uh, this one um, by, um, oh, I wrote it down. Uh, Robert Wilson, and it's a Stevie Wonder mural. Stevie Wonder was part of Motown. He's wearing a Detroit shirt here, um, and it's on a music theater in the city center of Detroit. Um, why I'm discussing this particular mural as an example of historiographies of place um, is because this mural is really taken up by the organization that commissioned it, Murals in the Market, um, in their social media strategy. So it's really interesting to see um, the way they, they promote the festival, but also Detroit through promoting the, the making of video on Instagram of this mural. They keep kind of um, posting it and, and eliciting responses. Um, and also the way they promote sharing this particular mural and the, the story behind it. Because the artist Robert Wilson um, really wants to promote a positive image of Detroit. He's created this mural, but also another one on the other side of the building. Um, and he's also really promoting this uh, mural as a positive image of Detroit and referring to its uh, music history. Here is a, a detail of that specific mural and it mentions, so it's the, if you go back, it's, it's the R in Detroit uh, and it depicts the Fox Theater um, with all these local music legends, well, they're also world famous music legends from Detroit. So Stevie Wonder, Bob Seger, Juan Atkins, a big name in Detroit Techno, Icky and the Stooges, um, the Motown Review, John Lee Hooker, the White Stripes are also from Detroit and Aretha Franklin. Um, so that, that whole idea of stimulating and hashtagging uh, to promote this positive narrative around the city is really present in this, uh, this mural. Then finally, I want to move uh, to um, the social ties and community networks, the, the third um, uh, uh, perspective on cultural justice that the framework proposes. And for that, I want to discuss this mural um, in Mexican town. It's painted by Elton Monroe Duran. Um, and I interviewed him about his muraling and about his specific murals. Um, and it's really interesting to see how the community comes around his murals. Um, I'll show a bit more because it's quite a big one here. You see the other side and actually it's located on the parking lot of a store. So um, first of all, Elton Moron Duran created a sense of community around this uh, mural by, um, he was paid by a, a project fund to create it, but also he had to um, find additional funding. So he asked local companies to pitch in and this supermarket did. So they received the mural on their wall in return. Um, but what he also did was to include actually uh, both famous Mexican artists, but also local people on the mural. So you see the driver of the, of the truck here is actually the grandfather of the owner of the store. And there are also more local people depicted in the musicians uh, and the dancers that are on this mural. Um, and also he organizes, uh, the, the artist organizes painting parties. So people are actually invited to help color in the murals and so be part of the creation of it. And to really create a sense of local community because uh, the artist really wants these murals to be a depiction of um, a Mexican identity. And for the people living in Mexican town to be proud of their Mexican heritage and identity because this area is changing as well, actually close by Ford has bought the um, famous Detroit train station and is turning it into a research and development uh, um, uh, office. And this has really um, uh, driven up the prices in the neighborhood of all the buildings there. And the expectation is that this will be a very wanted area to live in, to have projects in uh, and really develop it. But um, Elton Monroe Duran really wants the, the original uh, uh, inhabitants to be proud of what the area is at the moment, which is uh, a Mexican part of Detroit. Um, 
But what you also see here is that that idea of identity politics in these multicultural neighborhoods doesn't have to be attention per se. So this is all working out quite well, actually. And it's not more a protest, but it's a celebration of local identity. So finally, I wanted to discuss this mural, um, which is actually the um, MC5 mural on the former Grandi Ballroom. Um, and uh, here there are more tensions present because the Grandi Ballroom used to be um, a major venue for rock music and the MC5 was a famous band in the US. It wasn't as well known in Europe, for example, but in the US it was really uh, one of the big rock bands. Um, and um, they started out their very short career here in the Grandi Ballroom in Detroit. At the moment, the building is owned by a church congregation, um, but there's also an online community called the Friends of the Grandi Ballroom that really want to preserve the building. And although they don't own it, they are very involved in trying to save the building um, and, and trying to turn it into um, uh, a place that both the church congregation and the Friends of the Ballroom can use and can be proud of. Um, one of their first uh, uh, efforts to do this of this online community was uh, have this mural created because um, it actually uh, helps the church congregation um, by avoiding uh, um, tickets for uh, uh, graffiti, uh, blight tickets, so to say, um, by having this mural there. Uh, also, it offers uh, something that people who stop here to watch the building because it's such a famous heritage uh, a location um, to offer them a place to have a picture for their Instagram channels again. Um, so, uh, and it also celebrates the history of the building. You see a black, uh, a white panther there, which is reference to the Black Panther movement that the MC5 wanted to support. Um, and you see Wayne Kramer, who's actually one of the driving forces by funding, and he also has funded this mural there. Um, the tension here, though, is that this is in a uh, black area of Detroit. Sorry, am I being yeah, yeah, it so, uh, would be great if you... Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll stop. But if we return to this picture, um, the online community where these people live is mostly in the blue areas, so the white areas around Detroit, while the former Grandi Ballroom is actually in one of the red areas. So it's, uh, and the church congregation is black as well. So there's a lot of tension there um, with this racial dynamic going on in the history of the specific place. Um, so that was actually also um, the final part of what, of what I want, wanted to say. Um, this paper is really about that contentious relation between the murals, gentrification, beautification, and these offline and online communities. Um, and sometimes it goes well, other times there is a lot of tension there. Um, and it really shows the, the tension in murals also between public art as um, resistance versus public art as a tool in gentrification. Um, so I, I would like to keep it at that. And I'll stop sharing. Sorry for being too long. Uh, thank, no worries. Thank you very much, uh, Leonike, for a really exciting uh, talk. And we now uh, go uh, ahead with Jelke. Thanks. Uh, I'm uh, based in Amsterdam, and I'm in an office in FFU on the canal here. And I just wanted to show the, the mural that I'm currently looking at. Uh, I'm not sure which platform it's aiming at, but uh, it resonated pretty well with your presentation there. Let me see. I guess you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Great. So first of all, thanks to Andre and Cornelia for organizing this seminar and inviting us to present our paper. And I'm saying us. Um, or our paper, because I wrote the paper that I'm presenting on with Niels van Dorn, uh, and he is the PI uh, in the Platform Labor Project, uh, which my PhD project is part of. Um, and the Platform Labor Project is an ERC-funded project that aims to determine how digital platforms are transforming the organization of labor, livelihood, uh, and governance in cities marked by eroding welfare systems. Um, 
And in particular, we're looking at how this or how digital platforms reconfigure the relation between market states and civil society. Um, so Niels looks into meal delivery and cleaning labor platforms. Uh, I have a colleague who looks into volunteering and care work platforms. And then my own PhD project um, focuses on Airbnb. Um, and I do field work in Amsterdam and Berlin uh, primarily. So what I'm presenting today um, is looking at how we might use gentrification theory to uh, understand professionalization of hosting on Airbnb. So I'll first dive into uh, commercial gentrification. I'm not sure if everybody is aware of the uh, commercial gentrification literature, so I'll quickly introduce it. Then um, I'll try to explain the analogy between professionalization uh, on Airbnb and commercial gentrification. Um, and to do so, I built on rent gap theory uh, from which we developed the concept of platform rent gaps. And from there, we focus on what role Airbnb actually has as a platform owner in uh, the professionalization of uh, Airbnb hosting. And lastly, I'll look at uh, what this has for consequences for variously situated hosts um, in Berlin primarily, but uh, they might, um, these results might speak to other places as well. So these are three images I took in uh, 2015 in the Java Strat in uh, Amsterdam East. Um, and I took them by the time because I had to give a presentation about commercial gentrification during my bachelor's, I think it was. Um, and what you see here are three at the time, new shops um, in this uh, culturally diverse, uh, ethnically mixed neighborhood uh, called Indy Subird. And I wanted to show them to kind of exemplify what commercial gentrification in cities looks like. And so this is uh, basically the upgrading of particular commercial functions. So think about shops, uh, cafes, restaurants, or hotels. And this upgrading is often to cater for higher income audiences to um, and what you often see is that um, older stores that cater to a poorer, more traditional and less mobile clientele um, are replaced by highly stylized, uh, designed and niche shops, bars and cafes, um, as you can kind of see here. Um, they cater to a much more highly educated, affluent and cosmopolitan, uh, often international audience. And I'm building here, or we are building here on uh, Sharon Suking and colleagues' work. Um, and they write about boutiquing as a particular type of commercial gentrification. And we're interested in boutiquing um, because of what it does for particular areas. And as they write, boutiques mark an area as safe for commercial investments. Um, that will upgrade services and raise rents. And this, this last part, uh, the raising of rents, um, is interesting because it relates to the rent gaps that I'll discuss in a minute. But first, I'll take a look at Airbnb. So the image you see on the left here uh, is one that I took in Berlin in 2019. Um, what you see are some lockboxes. Uh, you can use them to uh, to store a key to an Airbnb apartment or uh, whatever key you want to store in there. Um, and if you look closely, you can see that they're named after Venus, Saturn, and I think the other one is Mercur or Mercurius. Um, so these are a set of lockboxes for different apartments, presumably around this area. So if you would book an Airbnb apartment in this place, you might uh, get directions to this particular bike um, and get a code for one of these lockboxes that then gives you access to uh, a particular apartment. So this is, I think, an example of uh, professionalization, uh, which is something that you see more and more on Airbnb. Uh, and often um, uh, professionalization is exemplified by um, hosts who manage multiple, multiple listings, uh, so-called multi-listers. 
and they offer their listings for uh, basically year round or have very high availability. So this is no longer about home sharing um, and instead professionalization. Um, so it becomes much more common. It's, it takes an increasing share of all the listings on Airbnb, but it also brings in higher revenues. And so a disproportionate amounts of all the revenues on Airbnb goes to these professional listings. I'm trying to see my notes. So we argue that it's useful to see uh, professionalization on Airbnb as a form of com commercial gentrification. Um, I'm just wondering, can you now see the, the video preview on my slides or don't you actually see it? I guess you don't, right? We, we see your slides, yeah, nothing else. Still, right. Yeah, um, sorry for the interruption. Um, so a more, um, uh, it, it might seem more logical to look at uh, gentrification of Airbnb as a type of residential gentrification, because often what is offered on Airbnb are uh, homes. Um, but we think that commercial gentrification is a more interesting comparison uh, in this case, um, because these hosts, they run a business uh, on Airbnb. They run a business by monetizing their own homes. And for these hosts, professionalization seems quite straightforward. They might make more revenue if they manage their property um, in a more professional way. Um, but with this last quote uh, from Jason Sadowski, uh, who writes about the internet of landlords, uh, we want to shift the attention to Airbnb as a platform owner. So uh, as he writes, uh, don't think of the platform uh, as a uh, don't think of the platform as a landlord who owns a rental home, but as the owner of a shopping mall who invests in his property in order to increase economic productive productive activity. So if we see Airbnb as the mall owner, uh, we can understand that it in invests in the mall or in its platform uh, to increase productive activity. So in gentrification theory, um, rent gaps are used to uh, theorize why landlords um, um, invest in, in are able to invest in their property and, and make more rents. So um, what you often see is that over time, the actual ground rents, so that's the money that or the rents that uh, landlords receive from their property, um, it decreases. Um, but the potential ground rent rose, uh, goes up. Um, and this potential ground rent, they can realize it by um, evicting current tenants and replacing them with new uh, higher income tenants. Um, so this forms an, forms an incentive to uh, invest in property and attract a new type or a new group of tenants. So we built on this concept uh, to develop the notion of platform rent gaps. And these emerged when uh, higher potential rents could be made on a platform. And here there's a crucial role for data and datification. Uh, so Airbnb is a platform owner, but also other platforms, they are able to gather in intense amounts of uh, data on the transactions that happen on the platform. And using this data, they can answer questions uh, such as where and from what types of listing the large revenues are made, um, but also what types of listings might underperform. Um, so what kind of listings could be, uh, they could try to adjust in order to increase uh, the revenue made from those listings. And uh, like landlords um, in, in urban areas, uh, this forms an incentive for Airbnb uh, to close the rent gaps. Um, by adding new types of particular listings, but also by upgrading and professionalizing existing listings. And just to illustrate what this data actually is, uh, I think in 2017, Airbnb data analysts had access to 11 petabytes of data. Um, and that's 11 million gigabytes, 
or about 22,000 times the storage of my laptop. Um, so they have, they have uh, immense access to information about what happens on the platform and what is profitable and what isn't. And as professionalization is profitable, um, Airbnb tries to stimulate professionalization uh, of Airbnb hosts. And we've done a, a walkthrough analysis of all the tools and features that Airbnb offers. And there's more detailed information about this in our paper. Um, but what we basically found is that there's two types of uh, tools and features. One of them is based on labor-based professionalization. Um, and you can think about tools such as the Superhost uh, feature or the co-hosting feature. And we found that these primarily cater to small scale uh, traditional hosts, so the, the typical home share, um, but they are much less profitable um, than uh, asset based professionalization tools. And this is a, a bit more diverse set of tools that Airbnb offers uh, that includes a set of what they call pro tools. Um, and part of the pro tools is Airbnb Teams, which allows you to uh, manage your property with a team of employees or with a group of staff um, and it uh, affords multi-listing management so you can uh, easily um, manage a, a large number of listings at the same time but it also uh, includes uh, api based tools and an api is an application programming interface and this allows other people to build software that connects to airbnb um, and such software might include uh, property management systems, which uh, affords something like uh, multi-listing management, um, but it can also be all kinds of optimization tools that gather data that allow uh, particular hosts to increase their rents, or uh, in other words, to, to close the platform rent gaps uh, that they might be able to identify. I'll skip this slide so that I stay within time. Um, I'll now look into two, uh, two particular types of hosts that I met in Berlin during my field work. Uh, and I'll start with um, labor-based professionalization. So in our paper, we discuss uh, the story of Irina. Uh, she's a, a host in uh, the east of Berlin and she rents out a room in her own uh, subsidized rental home. And besides that, she also co-hosts for a couple of property owners. And what this already shows is that the notion of host is quite ambiguous uh, because they might be property owners. Um, a host might actually host in their own home, uh, but it might be a rental home, so they don't own it themselves. But a host on Airbnb might also just somebody might be somebody who provides hosting labor for property owners. So in Arena's case, um, she hosts in her own rental home. Uh, in her case, that's formally illegal. Um, and she hosts in uh, other people's properties. And as you by now probably have read from the quotes, uh, Arena is quite frustrated about her own situation. So she feels like she wants to take the next step um, in, her, in her hosting tra trajectory, in her professionalization tra trajectory, um, and become kind of an asset-based uh, host to pursue uh, a type of asset-based professionalization. Um, she's unable to do so because she doesn't have the space or she doesn't have uh, housing assets or real estate that she can use to, uh, to take this next step. And instead, she's dependent on others. And I quote her here, uh, these others are just investing in themselves, uh, that is their own housing assets, and they use me to make it running. So the asset-based professionalization tools, they do add value for her. Um, and she's quite proud uh, that she is a super host. But as a co-host, the, the added value uh, goes to property, owner, property owners primarily. And I see Cornelia popping up perhaps to, no, I'm still within time. Two more minutes, okay, should be doable. Um, 
So um, she is a super host, but the, the added value largely goes to property owners. Uh, and she's still dependent on them uh, for her earnings. And she still has to negotiate with these property owners to, uh, to set uh, how much she can earn as an Airbnb host. So ultimately, the labor-based professionalization tools uh, that Airbnb offers do not afford Irina to um, the means to expand her small and capital poor enterprise into the kind of hospitality business that she wishes to operate. Um, another story that we focus on is about Gaith, and he uh, owns a property management company in Berlin, uh, managed about 15 apartments uh, in Berlin, but also 20 apartments uh, in North America. And the services he offers uh, are to some extent similar to the ones that Arena offers, but he's able to do it on a, a much more um, hotel-like uh, scale. So they offer linen, but they also offer repair and minor maintenances for property owners. And he's able to do this by uh, keeping costs low uh, through managing the company's listings and staff uh, through an API connected property management system. And as he notes, and I quote him here, you actually need, you absolutely need a property management system. Without that, it's impossible. And what is impossible is to uh, to run an Airbnb business on the scale that he does and to manage large numbers of geographically dispersed apartments uh, with, a, uh, uh, with multiple staff members. I'll skip this slides to save some time. Um, so to conclude, data intensive professionalization uh, seems to be an, an overarching platform logic on, on Airbnb, um, and it's strategically, strategically developed and um, engineered by Airbnb. Uh, so it seems logical from the perspective of hosts, but as I've tried to explain, um, platform rent gaps emerge, and this forms the motivation for Airbnb uh, to stimulate hosts to pursue particular, particular strategies and to act in a particular way. And by affording and stimulating professionalization, Airbnb eventually is able to grow its platform ecosystem, uh, its revenues, and eventually the value of its platform. And this is beneficial for Airbnb as a platform, um, but it has consequences for the class composition of its host population uh, and the dis distribution of opportunities and challenges among them. Um, and here we should keep in mind that these hosts, they are using the platform and are active on the platform um, but at the same time, they live in particular cities uh, and they, uh, they rent out property in particular neighborhoods. And as other research has shown, um, these properties are predominantly located in uh, gentrifying um, or already attractive uh, neighborhoods in, uh, in particular cities. Um, so we speculate, this, spe speculate that these platform rent gaps might add uh, and reinforce uh, existing rent gaps in cities. Um, so that's where I want to end. So we go ahead with Maya Clausen. So Maya, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Okay. And uh, thank you to you, Cornelia and Andrea Jansen, for inviting me here today. Um, I will share my screen and hopefully it works again. I hope you see my screen now. Yes, we do. Okay, great. Um, so the study uh, I present in the article in the special issue uh, was carried out as part of a VLOX funded project uh, that ran on Copenhagen University, where I was a postdoc, um, and the project ran from 2013 to 18. Um, currently, I'm an assistant professor at University of Southern Denmark, and I work in between media studies and, and cultural studies. Okay, here. Yes. Um, in my article, I draw on empirical material to critically discuss the Danish strategy of digitalization understood as a Lefebvrean conceived space. 
and I try to bring forth how it interlaces with the revitalization programs for the area called Sudhavn or the South Harbor in Copenhagen. Uh, this area has been uh, over the last 10 to 15 years uh, shaped by um, a large rollout of uh, revitalization as have many other areas of Copenhagen, but for various reasons, I focus on Sudhavn. Um, the top rollout, oh, I can't see what it says on the slide, here we go. The top rollout of digital self-service, I argue um, in the article, resembles a sanitation or gentrification of the digital public infrastructure in how it implicitly prioritizes digital skills and resources more pertinent in some groups than others. And from this argument, I move on to explore the lift spaces of digital citizens. In this case, older citizens living alone in subsidized housing complexes and on their state pension in Sudhavn. So um, a little history and, uh, and context. Um, in the 1990s, Sudhavn was targeted for the development of public rental housing. And today, waterfront uh, redevelopment in the area is taking shape as apartment complexes complete with access to waterfront and glass balconies, underground parking facilities. Um, they uh, uh, sprout up around the area. And these complexes are built to house primarily middle and upper middle class families, as is stated in documents from Copenhagen municipality. This means that the demographics traditionally characterizing Sudhavn um, with a vast majority of working class people are changing. And this area has been dubbed the most unequal district um, in Denmark. Um, and with its uh, many old traditional working class flats, uh, this part, the old part of Sudhavn is described now as being detached from the development of the rest of Sudhavn in the same uh, document from Copenhagen municipality. And I just, uh, this line you see, I mean, I hope also the images they show uh, where the red brick uh, housing of the old Sudhavn is, and we have the waterfront housing on the new Sudhavn. So some, uh, some numbers. In the newly built part of Sudhavn, one third of all flats have kids. In the poorest part of Sudhavn, one out of 10 flats house kids. One out of three citizens living in the newly developed Sudhavn has a long education. And in the not yet gentrified parts of Sudhavn, one in 10 has a long education. Although the gentrification is causing a rise in, for example, income and education levels for the area, Sudhavn is to this day still characterized by the majority of residents being unemployed, unemployed as 25%. And the majority of residents being early retirees are having a lower uh, income compared with other parts of Copenhagen. Moreover, the majority of citizens living in the not yet revitalized parts of Sudhavn are 65 plus, Two thirds of them are living alone and the life expectancy in Sudhavn is lower compared to the rest of Copenhagen with a high number of deaths caused by smoking and drinking and unhealthy living. Um, in my article, I aim at analyzing the interplay of gentrification and the public sector digitalization within a geomedia studies framework. I draw on kind fast and colleagues um, who define geomedia in an inclusive non-media centric manner. They write that it is a relational concept that captures the fundamental role of media in organizing and giving meaning to processes and activities in space. This conceptualization calls for interdisciplinary investigations of the geographical qualities of media at large texts, technologies, and institutions, and I think also invites uh, critical thinking about the development and adoption of communication infrastructures and digital divides. The article then, then does not examine questions of 
the right to the city through analysis of the urban material and environment in relation to geomedia technologies in any narrow sense. It takes a different route and assembles gentrification through the question of belonging as I explore citizens' experiences within um, digital public sector understood in social spatial terms. It points to how the ideal of the digital citizen implied in the strategy of digitalization can be thought of as combining with and reinforcing ideals and power geometries pertaining to gentrification processes and the making of smart cities and smart citizens. The restructuring of physical urban space uh, and digital infrastructure alike is saturated with neoliberal ideology causing a homogenizing of social space that reduces the capacity for belonging for certain citizens. So I focus on gentrification and its intertwinements with digital public infrastructure and the figure of the digital citizen. And I seek to demonstrate aspects of how this rollout of Danish government's digitalization strategy is transforming not only digital infrastructures, but through the working of Lefebvrean spatial codes that I'll talk a little bit about in a second, also are transforming material structures for urban everyday life, especially for citizens struggling to practice digital citizenship. So the strategy of digitalization, I suggest we should conceive, think of as a conceived space. Conceived space, according to Lefebvre, is planned abstract space without life, and, write, and Lefebvre writes that it is the space of the bourgeoisie and of capitalism. It's the space of the city planner, the architects, the scientists, and in a geomediatization optique, the app developers, the platform owners, and the digital infrastructure architects. Capitalism is in the famous optique founded on an antagonism between conceived space and the lived spaces of everyday life. In this antagonism lies the possibility for a dominant group to organize social space in ways that sustain its own interests over those uh, of others, as Christian Fuchs also talks about. Um, a conceived space, as a conceived space, the strategy of digitalization has an ordering effect on the lived spaces of everyday life. Um, focusing on the geographies uh, of the strategy, efforts are tuning into which ideals and norms are being more or less implicitly promoted in the strategy. Um, and I explore these as spatial codes opening and expanding or diminishing lift space uh, for certain groups and not others. When approaching the strategy of digitalization and its ideal of the digital citizen, I draw uh, on the work of Yannick Skov and Martin Yelhot uh, from the IT University of Denmark, who have analyzed digital citizenship discourses in the Danish digitalization strategies between 2002 and 15, 2015. I suggest that their findings can be put to work in a geomediatization framework. Um, Scott and Yelhold deploy a discourse theoretical approach to show how the figure of the digital citizen reproduces neoliberal conceptions of subjectivity, concerned with efficiency, productivity, individualization, and collective responsabilization. They demonstrate how the strategies work as collective imaginaries and mobilize digital citizenship in relation to business, sameness, and individuality. Expanding this, I suggest understanding the digitalization strategy as a Lefebvrean conceived space and thus as part of the production of social space. A spatial code, Lefebvre writes, is not simply a means for reading or interpreting space. Rather, it is a means of living in that space, of understanding it, of producing it. Thinking through spatial codes turns urban space into a medium for the development of social practice and the collective imaginaries produced in conceived space. We are concerned with logical epistemological space, the space of social practice, the space occupied by sensory phenomena, including products of the imaginations, such as projects and projections, symbols and utopias, Lefebvre writes. Following Lefebvre, is um, the theory, uh, the role of theory is to expose emergence, uh, pur purpose and disappearance of the spatial codes. The articulation of the digital citizen uh, in the digitalization strategy is simultaneously 
a social practice, a symbol and a utopia. I argue that we need to pay close attention to how different actors assemble to perform digital citizenship in order to visualize which power geometries emerge here. Finally, um, Lefebvre notes that codes are specific to a particular society. Indeed, they stipulate an affiliation to that society. To belong to the given society is to know and use its code, codes. Um, so I argue that to know, practice, and live with and through digital media in times and spaces marked by geomediatization is then to understand the codes marked, uh, marking this space. So what did I do then? Um, well, I did, uh, I did field work and I did observation at a place called IT Hjelpen or the IT Help in Sydhavnen. Um, it's a place run by um, one person who was uh, not permanently employed and she has no training. It just happened that she was sitting there already being unemployed herself, but she was helping uh, fellow job seekers out in this process of seeking for jobs uh, digitally. And then the, um, the South Harbor Community Center hired her temporary to, uh, to help out, which uh, turns out she was, she was now hired half a year at a time and she'd been there one and a half year when I was there. So I did observation sessions there during uh, IT assistance. Uh, and I did 11 semi-structured qualitative interviews with Sydhavn citizens between the age of 64 and 92 um three men eight women um eight women yes and to move on because time is running uh the analysis falls in sort of three or four parts uh where the strategy of digitalization that i just talked about and how i conceive it as producing codes and then i move on to looking at the gentrification of Sydhavn. Uh, suggesting ET and analyzing it as an excluded space drawing on uh, Bataille. Um, it's not part of my presentation now. And then I look at Kirsten, a 67 year old lady, and how she describes media technologies in relation to her lived space. Then I also analyze these uh, IT assistance sessions um, at ET Yelten. And to focus on uh, and start with Kirsten and uh, what I've uh, called the diminishing of, uh, of lift space. Uh, Kirsten is anxious about digital media and how they might affect us. During the interview, Kirsten finds a newspaper cut out from an article with the headline, five out of six people uh, have smartphone dependence. She has kept it to remind herself that this kind of technology is not good for us, as she puts it. Digital technology and its users are also emerging when she describes the development in Sydhavn. I suppose they, the politicians and architects she's referring to here, are being farsighted and all this building is for the future. They're building houses all over on every lot and so densely everywhere out here they built. And now there are people who can afford to live in these expensive flats. It's all prestige projects, right? It's built so densely that it will be the future ghetto, this new Sydhavn. I enjoy feeling the wind in my face and going for a walk, people watching, calmness and presence, not staring into a screen. But so much has happened out here, building sites all over so you have nowhere to go. Kirsten's lift space is being restructured as the new Sydhavn is sprouting up around her and digital technologies are omnipresent and by her experience as a threat. Gentrification has remapped her roots and only because of knowing the area is she able to carve out space for belonging in the way that she prefers to belong, wind in her face and a calm place. The quote moreover illustrates conceived space as a superior space of power and the antagonistic relation between conceived space and lived space. The workings of conceived space are automatically assumed to be for the best, hence her, I suppose they're being farsighted. And Here's a picture of Gitte receiving uh, IT assistance uh, from Kit at the IT help. Uh, Gitte is uh, a 79-year-old woman. Uh, she drops by IT help on a regular basis twice a month. Um, Kit introduces me to Gitte, who has in advance agreed that I could observe the session. And Gitte carries with her a plastic bag, out of which she takes a mouse, a mouse pad, a laptop, and its charger. 
Gita and Kit get themselves installed at the desk and Gita turns on her laptop while telling Kit, I was so happy yesterday. Um, I was able to go on Facebook, whoops. Yeah, I was able to go on Facebook um, and everything, but the eight box uh, and my key card are causing trouble. This is why she's here to receive help locking into her eight box where she has all, as all Danish citizens receive communication from Danish public authorities. Meanwhile, her laptop is old and the software, according to Kit, is not updated, which forces them to turn it off and use Kit's laptop instead. Kit then asks Gita to log into Abox herself. Kit assists by reading out loud the number code with the six digits from the key card while Gita types them in one by one and the logon is successful. You did this yourself, Kit says, and Gita replies, I did? No, really? I can't believe it. Yesterday, I just couldn't. How lovely. This small part of the session uh, that I describe here, I suggest points to the efforts being put into trying to live a digital life, as well as to the joy connecting to succeeding. I suggest that this illustrates how digital citizenship might work as an object of desire following uh, Lauren Ballant. Whoops, end quote. Um, the motivation behind the strive can, of course, be partly connected to the practicalities entailed in being able to read and answer mails from public authorities and going on Facebook, but also partly, I argue, to a desire to be accommodated within and belonging to the mediatized society. Gita's lift space as a digital citizen living in Sydhavn is unfolding and being practiced in part in the basement of the community center where Ita Yeltsin is situated using both technology and skills that belong to someone else. And I wonder, yes, I should end now. I will skip this last example. It's in the article and conclude. Um, the geomedia studies I approach, I see as inviting a visibilizing of how and where textures of space and place interweave with media affordances, habits and preferences of various socioeconomic groups. In the article, I then use this framework to explore the interplay of mandatory digital self-service implied in the digitalization strategy with gentrification. And I suggest that this interplay potentially tilts the socio-spatial power geometry in favor of those citizens who can actually practice digital citizenship. Those citizens who know and use the spatial codes inscribed in mediatized societies like the Danish. And that was it for me. I stop sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Maya. I just go back to the for the video to the uh, gallery view. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, with uh, that, I would like uh, to open uh, the discussion and of course also uh, comment around. So who wants to start? Yeah, Jelke, please. I've got a question for Maya. <clears throat> um, I, I was curious, what does the uh, digitalization uh, strategy exactly entail? Does it um, does it require from Danish citizens that they use uh, digital means to connect with the government, or does it is it more like an empowering, uh, enabling? It's, it's uh, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's definitely framed uh, in official documents as an empowerment of the citizens and also it will improve uh, quality and efficiency of public authority communication. Um, and it implies, uh, it had as a, as a goal that by 2015, 80% of the Danish population should be digital citizens and have this eight box um, that is the, uh, the mailbox for digital mail from public authorities. And this goal was reached and also uh, more so. And it was stated that you could become exempt from being a digital citizen, but you had to apply for exemption and you apply by showing up at citizen service uh, in, in person. And you have to reapply every year. They recently changed this, um, but of course this reapplication process made it also difficult, especially for senior citizens who had difficulties showing up and, and this was, um, it, it was quite a hassle also. Several of my research participants, they described this. And one of the rules was that if you owned a laptop, you could not become exempted. 
So I, I had a couple of, of uh, informants also saying, well, I, was, uh, I inherited a laptop uh, from my grandson. Uh, so I had it and I, I told them, yes, I do have a laptop. Well, then you're a digital citizen. And in Scandinavia, we have high level of trust. And in older generations, we have an even higher level of trust in public authorities. So my research participants, they were in general very, um, they were very compliant. And if they had uh, an old, not functioning laptop in the closet, then they would say, okay, so I have to become a digital citizen. Um, so it was it's it's very top down rolled out, and they made it quite difficult to actually uh, dodge this. I hope that answers the question a little bit. If not, then I would uh, definitely please uh, read modern modern scope and uh, Yelhot and scopes their analysis of the strategies. It's it's yeah. It's, Thanks, it's clear. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thanks. Andre. Yeah, thank you. Maybe my, my question is not really relevant anymore, actually, because it was precisely about the issue of trust, and it was to you then, Maya, because it was it struck me during your presentation that it seems like trust and, and, and confidence in, in public authorities seems like a kind of precondition. So for, for taking this type of leap in digitalization and perhaps also then it's an important um, element in gentrification gentrification processes so maybe you want to elaborate more on that particular thing Other, otherwise i didn't have any more question <laughs> yeah well yeah absolutely and we also saw it in this quote um by kirsten that this this assumption that it's it's for the it's probably for the best and they're being far-sighted i have this uh, very much present in in my interviews and also not only in this study, but I also interviewed uh, senior citizens who are communicating digitally with their doctors. And even though they might not be completely uh, thriving with the digital communication, they still place a lot of trust that this is probably for the good. Someone out there knows what they're doing when they're asking us to do this, which is interesting. Um, and also a, a, a generational thing, as I said before. So I guess I don't have that many more comments, but I think in, in it's, well, one comment that we, we had very good conditions for this rollout in Denmark and Scandinavia with this high level of, of trust. Um, and Denmark has definitely um, also used it to brand itself um, as also winning <laughs> winning the, the World Cup, as we said, in, in digitalization, public digitalization, something uh, Danish politicians, they are not, uh, they remind us about this very often that we won this uh, in, well, just recently. Um, yeah. yeah. It reminds me on that uh, the digital strategy in Sweden stated that they want to be the world leader in digitalization. Sorry. Uh, Mekonen? Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for the presentations. I think this is uh, a relevant and uh, topical issue uh, it's going to be even more so I believe because um, the way I see it we are uh, going into a huge crisis uh, come fall uh, winter anyway so the question these questions will be even more relevant um, that's my my uh, hypothesis anyway um, I have some reflections. Uh, I can begin with uh, a question to <clears throat> Yeke uh, regarding the rent gap. Um, I don't know if uh, I misread or misunderstood your uh, presentation, but uh, the way Neil Smith used uh, uh, the argument was structured, the argument was that uh, building values decline and the potential rent gap increases correspondingly. At the same time, the current rent, uh, actual rent is high, but it's not as high as the potential, but it's still above the building value. So um, how do you reconcile this with the fact that the Airbnb are located in areas that already have high value? Uh, central areas, uh, 
gentrified, as you said, or being gentrified uh, gen uh, on the way to being gentrified. So uh, the way I see it, there is a, a tenuous relationship within, with the theory here. Um, so my second question reflection would be to Leonike and I don't know if you, I'm, I'm assuming you have discussed this, but I have to raise it anyway. Um, the way events unfolded in Detroit uh, is that, as you know, it was only the part uh, inhabited by Afri African Americans uh, and other ethnic groups that was under bankruptcy that was under austerity urbanism as James uh, Jamie Peck calls it. Uh, the, other, the other parts of Detroit, they were doing very fine. Actually, they were flourishing. So uh, here we have a case of class war, ethnic war, racial war. And you could, this is, this is renovation as uh, uh, they, the term that is used in uh, urban studies in Malmö, for instance, where you yeah, uh, willfully remove people by, again, in, speculating on the rent, rent gap. So, so your reflections on that, um, in what ways does culture and cultural discourse come in uh, and also yeah, enhance or resist this racial ethnic war? Uh, in Detroit. And finally, my reply, um, a question to Maya. Um, I find it interesting uh, that also the targeted group is the elderly. And uh, my question would be to you, to what extent have you uh, observed cases of digital stigma where the elderly, uh, actively seek to avoid digital stigma, not to be stigmatized as digitally Ill illiterate and uh, in different ways try to be part of this uh, digital panoptical prison. Um, yeah, thank you. Shall I start with the first uh, question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. So let's let's just go in the direction uh, in the same order than the questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thanks a lot for uh, your question. Um, and you're right uh, about Neil Smith's original formulation of a rent gap. Um, and as a first step in my answer, I'd like to refer to authors who looked into how uh, short-term rentals within cities uh, create new rent gaps. Um, so there's work by, uh, for example, um, uh, Waxmuth in uh, he's based at McGill University in Canada, and he argues that um, short-term rentals or Airbnb uh, is able to attract new streams of visitors and capital from abroad into particular neighborhoods, um, and in that sense, it creates a new use for for housing or for real estate um, that has a much uh, that that. Uh, allows property owners to uh, generate higher rents. So that's a rent gap in space that's kind of opened by short-term rental. Um, and they, they focus a lot on trans, transnational gentrification. So uh, it's uh, new streams of international uh, visitors that come to cities uh, and that create this, this rent gap uh, by, uh, by renting short-term rentals. The platform rent gap that we look into, um, it operates on another level in a way. Um, so it, it, it has relations to this rent gap in, in urban space, um, but we see this rent gap primarily uh, on the platform itself. Um, <clears throat> so to make it a bit more practical, uh, Airbnb might see that, uh, for example, hotels in Amsterdam um, are very much preferred and there's high demand for hotels. Um, and they see this because there's a lot of guests looking for hotels or for professional, professionally managed listings in Amsterdam. What Airbnb then can do uh, is try to match this with uh, new supply. Um, 
So they can uh, write to hotels, contact hotels, and ask if they want to list on Airbnb. And this is indeed what Airbnb has been doing since, I think, 2017. They uh, allow boutique hotels to list on Airbnb. Uh, and similarly, if they see that um, listings with this, this with such a lockbox where you don't have to actually have contact with the, the Airbnb host, um, if they are more popular and if people are willing to pay more for that or are more satisfied uh, after they booked such a place, um, we think that Airbnb can then, uh, they can see from the data that if more listings like that would be present on the platform, and if more people would operate in this way, uh, they uh, start to stimulate uh, existing Airbnb hosts to professionalize um, and change their practices to also buy a lockbox um, to, uh, for example, renovate their home so that it conforms more to the Airbnb aesthetic and to the, to the uh, preferences and, and demands from, um, from these guests. Um, so indeed, it is in, 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 these listings might be predominantly located in gentrifying areas already. Um, but what they do is in a way uh, adapt not to this particular territorial and to this particular territory that they're based in, um, but adapt to this kind of deterritorialized de -territorialized platform um, and the preferences people have on this platform. And I hope this answers your question. So Leonike, would you go ahead? Yes, yes. Um, thanks for that question. Yeah, indeed, um, it plays a huge, huge role. Um, I think uh, Goldster has called Detroit the donut of despair uh, in that the, the downtown area is, is prosperous. Then there's a, a kind of a ring of, of very poor neighborhoods. And then the suburbs are actually extremely wealthy. And some of the wealthiest postal codes in America are actually in the, the metropolitan Detroit region. Um, and this causes a lot of tensions as well. And I think the, the final mural I discussed, the MC5 mural, really um, displays that tension going on because um, the, the online community, the Friends of the Ballroom, who wants to kind of um, um, uh, redevelop the building and, and make it into a museum for that uh, rock history of the, of the former venue, um, they are located in, in the suburbs and are pretty wealthy, white, predominantly, uh, uh, inhabitants of that area, while the owner of the building uh, is, is this African-American congregation. Um, and the congregation itself actually has some money, but the, 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 the people living in the area are actually quite poor. It's, it's not a well-to-do neighborhood. And this really creates tensions. And, and the tension goes back a long time already because when the, the venue was still up and running and popular, there were already tensions there with these people visiting from the suburbs, creating traffic chaos uh, and noise pollution as well, and, and local locals complaining about this. Um, and and um, it's even up until today, the congregation uh, in first instance tried to stop the, the heritage uh, a marker for the building uh, and designation of it. Um, and there are a lot of struggles. And actually the building is now for sale while the uh, friends of the ballroom weren't told about this. So there's there's again, this whole new dynamic going on. And, and um, wealth plays a role, ethnicity plays a, a role and this history plays a huge role. Um, and the mural is just one of the ways in, in which that comes to the fore, but there's a whole history and a whole dynamic going on there um, that, that's behind uh, everything that's going on with, with that specific case. Yeah. Maya? Yes. Uh, and you, you also raised your hand for a question, so you could... Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I, can, I can maybe pose my question after uh, answering. Um, uh, the question that was given to me, and thank you for that. Um, with regard to uh, seeing examples of the citizens trying to avoid digital stigma, it was actually, I think it, it was all I saw, also because I actively sought out citizens who were on the verge of being non-users, uh, the citizens who were in need of help in order to be able to practice their digital citizenship. Either they needed to go to the ETH or they had 
this warm expert um, hotline that they could they could uh, turn to when whenever the technology is acted up. So I I, I deliberately choose not to uh, interview non-users. I chose to interview those who were the struggling users, the struggling citizens, in order to try and visibilize what, what were these struggles about and what, what are the motivations um, and what are, what are the promises of digital citizenship and how do they motivate uh, these users. Um, there was, for instance, an, uh, an 80 year old man I interviewed and he was very proud that he had become sort of his community's go to person with regard to IT assistance. And he gave me a full tour of, of his home and the, the, the two screens that he had and he it was old equipment, but he was he was optimizing and he was doing the best he could and this role of the IT janitor of his community was something he prided himself of very much, um, which also speaks of that this is connected to um, privilege and power. If you can tame the technologies, if, if you can label, label yourself a digital citizen, uh, you are accommodated. And if not, this comes with a price, um, this stigma that, that, you, that you ask me about. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, so um, so my question is for for Leonike, and thank you uh, for great presentations. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, when you talked about the Stevie Wonder uh, mural, if you encountered uh, off or online any sorts of protests or the like with regard to how it was uh, commodified or commercialized, uh, as you spoke about. Um, the, yeah, could 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 you did you do did you encounter that or was that just not happening? Um, well, what I um, uh, uh, saw online in terms of of comments and engaging with the mural that was actually all pretty positive, um, but also rather superficial, and. Um, the, it was mostly uh, short comments and, and really supporting it and liking it. And there was not a lot of critique in there. Now, this can have two reasons. Uh, first of all, the way I analyzed this, <laughs> maybe I just didn't do uh, uh, an extended enough uh, a search on Instagram uh, uh, to find these more negative comments. Uh, and I think in terms of methods, there is something to say about this whole cultural justice framework. Um, yeah, whether it is quite complex actually, and to research all these dimensions and it, it entails a lot of data. And I'm, I'm not, um, I, I think it's good to have these different perspectives, but also there, there are some cons to using it, I think. And this is one of them. Um, so that's something to look into for future research, I think, how, how you can have more sophisticated analyses of these uh, Instagram reactions. Um, uh, second, um, yeah, are they there? Are they posted on Instagram or are they present somewhere else? And I did see more critical remarks, for example, in, in the newspaper articles that I analyzed um, and also in the interviews that I did. Um, there were some more critical remarks, uh, especially about um, um, not so much the mural itself, but about the projects that, that some of these murals are part of. So you have uh, Murals in the Market, which is a, a private foundation organizing it every year to have new murals uh, around Eastern Market area, but also in other spaces. That's, that's still okay, but there's also this City Walls project run by the municipality. Um, and that really has some criticism. And um, right now it focuses more on a, a recent project. There's a new automotive factory uh, in Detroit um, and they, uh, the, the wall of the factory, they wanted to have murals there and they had this big uh, um, a request for muralists to put in proposals to put murals there. Um, and then there was an outcry from, from local people saying, well, but you're obscuring the fact that you have again displaced people to build this new factory in the city uh, and you want to make this wall pretty, but actually the whole project is not that pretty. And you're really impacting our neighborhoods and trying to cover that up by having this nice wall here with all these beautiful murals. So um, it, it's not that mural particularly, but there is opposition to, to these projects there. Um, and related to neighborhood change and, and the way local communities are, are involved or are not involved. Um, yeah. 
So that, that is going on. And they're not specifically music murals, but muraling uh, in general kind of creates these uh, contradictions. Yeah. Uh, Andre? Yeah, thanks. I, I could also have a, a question for Leonike because I was thinking uh, during your presentation about the role of nostalgia in various ways, and especially when, when there was this mural with the, the postcard, which is like this old analog medium, and there was greetings from Detroit or so, and I, it looked like, and I, I suppose it was based on an original postcard from the 70s or something and 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 so forth and i, I mean it seems like the nostalgia is a very strong element of of this transformation so i mean to to what extent would you say that nostalgia plays into gentrification processes in in uh, in detroit and and again is there some kind of struggle over the fact that history is remediated in this way <laughs> yeah um i think uh it, it depends a bit um i think certainly when when looking at uh um the group of murals that is focused on especially the motown history of detroit there's an element of nostalgia there uh, and the success uh, of this genre and uh um, the, the way that represents a, a very um, good part or, or um, a positive uh, element of, of Detroit history when the city was doing really well uh, and this genre came to symbolize that, that too in a way. Uh, and and that's, that's, I think, is, is certainly an element there. Uh, and pride of, of having this, uh, all these famous artists that came from Detroit. Um, so in that sense, I think it's there. But if you look, for example, to um, the murals that are in Mexican town and celebrate Mexican identity, I'm, I'm not sure if nostalgia really is, is the word to, or the concept to, to connect to that. Um, but yeah, maybe in a way as well, but is it nostalgia or is it more celebration uh, of that identity also in, in the, the current? Uh, a situation so um I, I think to some extent it's there but also it's it's not all uh of what makes these murals uh i think um meaningful to at least to people who live there and who engage with them um uh also because uh the the robert wilson mural really is is framed in that uh a postcard style but i think the other murals are um they yeah they don't look like that and i think that is that is one but if you look at at the murals i studied it's actually more of a uh an exception than what the other murals look like so they're not as nostalgically framed in that sense um yeah and um mm, yeah, and I, I think the the struggles that that I see around certain murals, well, but also with that MC5 mural again, there is an element of nostalgia for what the venue represented in the past. Um, so yeah, and I need to think a bit more of it. There are certainly elements there, but also there's there's more going on, there are other elements playing into it as well. So it's yeah, I think yeah, it it's more. Um, it interplays with a lot of other things going on in in in, in these social situations there and, and the communities that play into it. But yeah, in some aspects, it you can say it's about nostalgia as well. But and that's maybe also because I look specifically at music murals and music heritage, and that of course already has a strong link with uh, with nostalgia there. Um, I think if you look at other work on music heritage, then nostalgia is one of the threads that always runs through it. Uh, also, in my previous work on music tourism, that, that really was a strong theme in there as well. So, um, yeah. So, are there... More questions or comments? So if 
If not, I would close uh, our seminar. It was really very exciting, great uh, um, talks. Uh, thank you for all for your participation. Um, of course, as well as the uh, fruitful uh, discussion that we had uh, in the end. Yeah, it was great to see you and uh, hope I see you at our next seminar. <laughs>